Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today, we have Russell Shaw, the godfather of real estate himself. And he's here to share how his team's consistently selling 41 times what the average agent sells. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm Steve Trang, broker and owner of Stunning Homes Realty, co-founder of the OfferFast app, the only app you need for wholesaling. And I'm on a mission to help as many people as I can. So please, if you got if you need any help with your business at all, please do not hesitate to private message me. I'd love to help you. And if you're excited for today's show, please give me a wave or a thumbs up. And as a reminder, I don't charge a dime for this show. I don't make any money doing this. So here's all I ask. This is the only thing it costs you to listen to this show. If you get value from this today, please tell a friend. Either share this episode right now, tag a friend below, or tell them your best takeaway from the show later on so that we can all grow together. And don't forget, this is a live show, and so it's interactive. Please post your questions, and Russell will be very happy to answer them. Ready? I am ready. All right, we're going to go with the tough one first. What got you into real estate? I didn't want to. I, I was an ex-life insurance salesman. and I, Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, I spent uh, five years in the life insurance business, and I hated it. Uh, which helped me to be unsuccessful in it, even right. though I was mildly a success, but I just was not really, I wasn't happy. Yeah. And I knew I didn't want to sell cars. And I didn't know what else to do. To be quite candid, uh, it, if you said at the time, was this my life plan? Mm -hmm. Nope. I just thought, I'm not sure what else to do. Maybe I'll sell real estate. And sure, that's, why not? that's how I got, that is literally... I saw it almost stumbled into it. A lot you, of people me, I knew, huh? You, me, and the other 40,000 peers. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then what were some of your early struggles in real estate? I didn't have the slightest idea of what I was doing. Um, my mentors uh, were morons, um, <laughs> quite literally. Um, it, it's they, they, The level of help they gave me was so idiotic. Uh that I, I just struggled from deal to deal, and I never quite knew my first year or so what I was actually doing to get business. I, mm -hmm. I, couldn't, I didn't have the name for it, so I would just sort of bumble around and yeah. get deals. But if you just said, was it some kind of plan? It was sort of so random that, uh, that I, it almost defies belief that I survived. Well, I think a lot of our colleagues probably have very similar stories either before when they started mm -hmm. or still today those that are listening on right now that are still struggling so uh toy asked the question uh what do you recommend if you're brand new out of school to be successful well hopefully you have lived here a while and if you look at how most agents get most of their business mm -hmm. whether they know it or not once i actually knew the answer to this question it yeah. was much easier because sometimes you have people that are doing something that works, but they don't know the right name for it. Right. And so they, they can't repeat it repeatedly. They can't keep doing it because they don't really know what it was they did. Yeah. They, it just seems to them like God was happy with them that week, <laughs> or they got lucky, or they're living right, or some other idiotic wrong why. Mm -hmm. And so they attribute it to some external force that yeah. wasn't any of their own action. So if you look at what most agents get most of their business from. This isn't most top agents. Most top agents get most of their business from geographic farming. Mm -hmm. But most agents get most of their business by contacting people in their previously met database, mm -hmm. even if they don't have a database. Right. But if they were contacting people, they sort of know. That's where they get the biggest bang for the buck, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. And that's what I was doing that was working, but I didn't know that's what I was doing that was working because I just thought I was getting lucky when I would get the business. Right. But that is what the correct name is, contact people. So if you knew, like, let's go back to your question specifically, you're new in the business and you've lived here a while. Could you make a list of, say, 100 people that would recognize you on site? Yeah. Like if they saw you, they would know it was you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know them well. They would just know it was you. So the first problem a new agent has, that say I don't have or you don't have, mm -hmm. we get calls almost every day, someone calling to ask for advice about some issue on real estate. Yeah. Because they know we're in real estate. They know we're in the house selling business. And they might have a question that might seem random or specific, but nevertheless, they know what we're doing. Yeah. So when you're a new agent, 
they don't really know you somebody you i don't know you worked with for years at honeywell or you're an ex school teacher mm -hmm. or whatever you used to do they still think of you as that person who worked at honeywell or they still think of you as that person who used to be a, was a school teacher right and they don't think of you and go she's a realtor he's in real estate now and if you look at what most if the biggest barriers did they like you and trust you mm -hmm. go call on them tell yeah. them you're in the real estate business they're not necessarily ready to buy something right then. That's not the point. Yeah. But come out of non-existence. Let them know this is what you do now. It's like Brian Buffini says, don't stop being an undercover agent. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let them know you're in the real estate business. So let's say we've been doing that now. We've been letting everyone know. for It's been a year now. Uh -huh. And we're doing one every other month, right? Not great, but enough definitely to keep this a sustainable business. Okay. Now I want to go to the next level. I want to be a top producer. Well, you're not going to go from six deals a year to top producer. Let me okay. start with that. So okay. I say that's not a real target. Okay. It really isn't. And, sure. and, that, and that one thing, that idea alone, is what causes most agents to invalidate themselves the most. Okay. If somebody's doing six deals a year, mm -hmm. the first thing I would do is get them to twelve, get them right. to eighteen, get them to twenty, get them mm -hmm. to twenty-five. Getting them to a hundred is not a real target. It's it seems unimaginable to them. Right. They uh, somebody doing six deals a year will look at somebody. They're, they're, it's not a correct viewpoint, but they're still nevertheless going to look at somebody doing a hundred deals a year, is almost some different type of being. Yeah. And that's not true, but it's still the view they're going to have. It's going to feel that way. So, in order to achieve any goal, the goal must seem real to the mm. person attempting to achieve it. So if you took, if somebody's doing six deals a year, the mm -hmm. first thing you know is they're spending most of their time working on crap that doesn't need to be worked on. Sure. That's obvious. Obvious, yes. You couldn't possibly have been working on dollar productive activities 40 hours a week or even 20 hours a week yeah. and sell six houses a year. It's not possible. No. No, you're, you're doing something that doesn't need to be done and lots of it. So <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I would say. Uh, they're, they're, they're goofing, but they, they're, they're doing stupid stuff that they think is sort of, uh, well, I'm working, I'm going to the office or some mm. other, that doesn't mean a damn thing. Right. So dollar productive activities are all that matters. Mm -hmm. And you'd look at what is a dollar productive activity, getting a new customer, showing a property, writing a contract, but something that you go, if I do enough of this, I'm going to get a lot of business. Yeah. Your money's coming in. Yes, eventually. It, right. it, there, that's a sub, that's a, but you get those sub-products before you get the final valuable product. Right. So go back to the guys tell, selling six houses a year. The first thing I would say you're going to want to do, no matter what stage you're at, if you don't already have it, is something you could use for a database. Like where you could keep a record of uh, in a computer of... Every person you've contacted, every email address you have, every phone number you've got, anything you remember about them, mm -hmm. their kid's name, their dog's name, I, it, whatever, their birth date, but someplace you could keep information not in your head and not on little <laughs> notes, some, right. some, some organized place to have it. Yeah. Every single time you meet someone, add them to that database and... You meet them, and it, it just just keep building those that 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 file of people you know, mm -hmm. and go back to the original thing: contacting people in your previously met database. There's agents doing fifty deals a year. That's all they do, is yeah. just contact people in their previously met database. Right. Highly so just effective. keep doing it. You would have when you contact them. You're not calling them every time, going, "How about it? Do you want a house?" You would, if you know them, you could call, you, you, I don't know, you see some newspaper article that makes you think of them. You see something in a magazine. You know about some concert coming to town. You know they like that artist. Mm -hmm. Call them. Tell them about so, something where you would have a reason. And if once they know you're in real estate, because what you're looking is you want to have, the more people like you and trust you. There's a, there's a young lady that I've been helping, and She's making this, she's been in real estate for a while, but she hasn't actually really been in real estate for you. Mm -hmm. She's been doing other crap. Okay. 
doing other crap. Not focused. So one of the things that you get all the way in the business. See, if you said, like my first 12, 13 years, I lived from deal to deal, just literally living from closing to closing, hoping to God I could get it closed in time to pay my rent, that kind of stuff. It was Mm. fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) But now what changed? What I did is I actually was working at the time on a career in stand-up comedy. And... Surprising, because you don't have a great system. I know. This is going to shock people. (laughs) But what was amazing to me is the number of things as I was making that transition and started playing in good clubs and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. I would have all these things that I wasn't going to do because I didn't need to pay $480, that was the real number, for refrigerator magnets at the time. Mm -hmm. If I was going to be on tour as a comedian in a year, why would I want to waste my money on crap like that? The number of things I decided not to bother with because it had, if you do this in real estate, it's only going to help you in the future in real estate. Mm -hmm. And I kept eliminating things that there was no reason for me to do. And I finally realized if I keep eliminating these, I'm going to be routing myself right out of the real estate business. Right whether I ever place, do anything else. And I decided just as an experiment for 90 days to pretend, this is really the truth, this is when my life changed, Yeah. to pretend that this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my working life. This is it. There isn't some big fantastic thing coming later. Mm-hmm. And I all my career had been if you'd have asked me when I got in the business, five years in the business, is this what you're going to do the rest of your life? No, no, no. Uh, what are you going to do? I don't know, but it's something fantastic. And it's going to be coming later. What is it? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, hmm. I wished I knew. <laughs> and when I finally decided to knock that crap off, yeah. and this was it, now what would I do? How would I behave if I knew this is what I was going to be doing the rest of my working life. What would be my attitude then? Mm -hmm. It took about two months before I thought, oh my God, I have zero interest in doing stand-up, traveling around, living out of a suitcase, uh, playing to smoke-filled clubs with drunks. I thought, no, I don't, this is nice. I love this business now. And uh, that's when I became a lister and decided I I, I wasn't going to work buyers and got rid of them quite literally and and so you can you can decide how you want it but it's sort of a thing of like when a new person comes in most people get in the business fail and they fail actually relatively soon and if you look this is an interesting stat if you say what company what company has the best without a doubt success information for agents of any country in the world any company Mm -hmm. Keller Williams. Keller Williams' level of knowledge, Mm -hmm. wisdom, is it's not only the best, there's no close second. Hmm. Okay. If rheology had any of that data, it would be a trade secret. They wouldn't be sharing any of it. Gary Keller shares all of it. Right. And now, if you look, what's the average production of a Keller Williams agent? Six deals a year. Mm -hmm. So apparently, having the wisdom, which they do. They do does not necessarily translate into success for each agent. Right. So there's a, there, there, there's a mental issue there. So the ones, that, the agents that wind up working with Gary or being coached by Gary, there's no question. Yeah. Those people blossom into monsters with almost without exception. Yeah. He's magical. But there's, there, it's, it's a mind shift. I'll give you an example. One time when after the millionaire real estate agent came out and Gary and Dave Jenks were in town doing something and I went up to I went to it just to see see them and say hi and I walked up to the stage after they were it was like in a break or they were done I can't remember and Gary asked me how are you doing and I said good and he said how much did you do last year I said "Uh, 53 million or whatever then it was some number in the low 50s Mm -hmm. and he said that's great I would expect nothing less from you you, sh- you should be actually doing twice that much. Yeah, That's Gary. 
And that was fantastic. And I did, by the way. I bumped <laughs> it up uh, because, well, now he's right. I'm not going right. to argue with him about that. But to do that when you've already done $50 million is a very different thing than your six deals a year. Yeah. So when you're at six deals a year, you have to start seeing yourself doing 20, 25 deals a year. But really see yourself doing it. Just decide that's what you do. Well, there's, so there's two things here yeah. that I heard. Well, so the first thing was there is you were all in mentally, mm-hmm. right? So there was a, a kind of a burning of the ships, mm-hmm. more or less. Like That is exactly right. So, that is exactly right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I don't know if you remember saying this to me, but there's many, many years ago you said this to me. All right, Steve, close your eyes, and you're doing 300 transactions a year. Mm-hmm. I don't Ooh. remember the number, but that's how, yeah. how I would have said something to yeah. you. Yeah. What does it look like? How many buyer agents do you yeah. have? How many listing agents yeah. do you have? What does your admin look like? What does the transaction look like? And that was a powerful message to me because that made a big difference in how I looked at my business moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dustin Hollinger asks a great question. What drives you? What keeps you going? Well, I, I'm not hungry like I was. Like I don't have that desperate, I have to get a deal. I don't have to get a deal. You now. don't, but your numbers are, look like you do. Yeah, but it's different now. Once you, uh, we're, we're about to ramp up again, Wendy and I. Up. Um, so. <laughs> uh, Did you slow down? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, we've been coasting. Yeah. We've been coasting. It, there hasn't been any heavy lifting for a while. Yeah. Um, so. It, it what it, it's more the fun and we want the money mm-hmm. like there's a certain point see somebody says well if you're a millionaire you're rich i don't know anyone and i've never known anyone who has a million dollars and thinks they're rich <laughs> uh, just let me to start with that yeah. it it seems fantastic when you're looking up at it once you're at that level it's not that fantastic you don't go oh my god i'm so amazing no you're not <laughs> no you're not so, you know, to achieve a goal, you have to look across or down. You can't be looking up. Like if the goal seems way up, mm-hmm. it's too big. You, you, have to, you have to make yourself bigger than that goal to do it. Sure. So I know that sounds funny, those words, but the yeah. English language just, there, there isn't better language that I know of to describe that. I don't know that I have a certain, like when you people talk about goals, you have to have a big why. Mm-hmm. I think that's nonsense. I think that's a complete crock of excreta. I don't know who dreamt it up. It sounds fantastic. Well, you need a big reason why. It sounds wonderful. I haven't figured mine out yet. Well, so. it's, it's nonsense. Let's say a guy decided, I'm not making a joke here. Yeah. He wanted a red Corvette so he could get laid a lot. Is that a big why? But say why. Well, but but my, re- my point is, People think this big why has to have some altruistic for the children, for the family, for mm-hmm. the... I don't think any of that's true. Could you have a goal that I just want a lot of money? Sure. Yeah. Could you say, I want two million cash in the bank? Could, you, could that be your goal? Of course it could. Mm-hmm. And you could go, what's the big why? I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I want it. That's, the, that's it. Yeah. When you want something, see, part of a goal... The, the sequence for getting any goal, achieving any goal, would be name, want, get. Correct technology only smooths out the get part. Mm-hmm. If you can name it exactly and want it unconditionally, you can get it. Hmm. But it's the issue of the want being confused or dispersed. Like most people, if you ask them their exact goal, they can't name it. Well, there's a problem right there. How yeah. could you want it if you can't name it? You can't hit it. No, no. You can't hit a target. You don't, you don't see. They, 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 they have this, well, I want to be rich. What the hell does that even mean? What would that mean? In what capacity? So, what, 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 but you understand, it's not yeah. a goal. You could go, because no matter how much you have, you won't feel that rich. Right. And you could go, I want to be successful. Again, what does that mean? Yeah. It would have to be to have a goal and call, uh, the, to, to, by the definition of said, of, of what it means, it would have to be something that you could check off as a done. Red Corvette qualifies. I, mm-hmm. I don't think I'm trying to sell Corvettes here. <laughs> uh, my, my point is, if you wanted a red Corvette, you would know when you got one. Right. You would know it was done, and you could take it off the list. Yeah. 
uh, you could make any goal that you could check off as a done could be a goal. But if you couldn't check it off as a done and go, I did it, it's not a goal. It's just some gibberish thought. So going back to the original question, uh -huh. so it's not money, but you're having fun. Yes. So is that what's driving? Is that you're just enjoying what you're doing? Oh, that's definitely part of it. I, yeah. I actually love what I'm doing. Yeah. I actually love what I'm doing. It, it's, it's an interesting thing I learned years ago from, he was a REMAX agent named Bob Wolf. He's out of Laguna Niguel, California. And uh, this is what Bob was doing. He was out of uh, Fort Collins, Colorado at the time. He was doing about 400 deals a year, and he seemed like a god to me. I was doing maybe 20 deals a mm -hmm. year. And he said, it was, it was on what could be delegated. And he made a list of, he took everything he didn't personally like to do. It's unfortunate he couldn't stick with his own list and wound <laughs> up going back and, and taking some of those things back. But it's interesting, he, it, the things that I would have never thought of, that he thought, you can delegate this, you can delegate that. So I yeah. took every single thing I looked at that I had a disagreement with doing personally and thought, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So what's left is the stuff I actually go, no, I like doing those things. Right. And so that's what I do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I never actually, I think, took the opportunity to share this with you. I've shared this with other people, even on the show. Uh -huh. But I don't know if you remember, 2011, 2012, I was doing REO business and short sale business. And REO business is easy, right? You just got to go meet a bunch of bankers, get them drunk, you get listings. <laughs> short sale listings are also pretty easy, right? They don't care how much they're getting for. Can you sell my house? Yes. Uh huh. Listing signed. There you go. Right? But I went through a transition where I was like, man, I'm going to have to get good at traditional listings. What do mm -hmm. I do? So I went out. Uh, I, I reached out to you, called your office, mm -hmm. and I got through to you, which I was shocked by. Mm -hmm. Right? And I asked you, and we had, we had uh, lunch at a cafe. I don't remember the name of the diner, but I asked you, I'm looking at these things. I don't know what to do, mm -hmm. but the market's changing. Yes. What do I need to do? And I asked you, I'm, I'm looking at Mike Ferry. I'm looking at Brian Buffini. I'm looking at Craig Proctor, and I'm open to any other suggestions. And you sat down with me, I think, for like an hour, hour and a half, mm -hmm. and you coached me through this, and I wouldn't be doing any of this if you weren't so kind well, thank you. to take my phone call yeah. and sit down with me. Yeah, and exactly. I still remember you walking through the door. I was like, wow, he's actually here. <laughs> and he sounds just like he does on the radio. So I just wanted to share that with you because I've shared you. that with other people, thank but thank you. I haven't told you that. I didn't know that. I, I yeah. actually had forgotten it, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, so one question, this goes back to Toy. Uh, how much do you spend in advertising every month? If you feel comfortable sharing. If you don't want to answer, you don't have to. I don't know the monthly number. It's about 800000 a year. Okay. I don't know on the. It's not even every month mm -hmm. because there's certain times of the year we spend more, and certain times of the year we spend a lot less. Mm. Like, like for example, in December, we don't spend a lot of money on I anything. See. For it's not a great month to advertise, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, what most of our advertising is based on getting future business. I, I think one of yeah. the things that's sort of an idiotic thing when I see people. Uh, promoting the concept that you must have a call to action. I go, really? So the consumer is so stupid that they won't know as long as they see your phone number, you're going, if you like what you see here, there's how to get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. you, instead of a call now, buy now, this is the one time, this mm -hmm. week. It sounds like some idiot. I mean, people buy and sell houses for either for market reasons or for personal reasons. Yeah. Most of my business is based on personal reasons. They're they're selling their house because they want to move, or their kid they want to they want to buy a different house. But they're not selling it because of some condition in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So personal reasons means that I'm not going to even remotely influence when they sell. Yeah, like that we're not telling them you have to do this now. They don't have to do it now. If they want to wait until November to sell, they can wait until November. It's their house. It's their move. <laughs> yeah. So most of the business, most of the ads are not saying you must call today. It, in, in actual fact, what if you look at what you're doing with geographic farming when it's done successfully, is you're becoming the trusted advisor that you're the one that knows about market conditions mm -hmm. in that area. And that's the number one thing the public, aside from honesty and trustworthiness, that the public wants from an agent is market knowledge. Yeah. So when you're doing that, you're, tell, you're letting them know, whenever you're ready, give me a call because I'm the guy, I'm the gal that knows this stuff. That's actually effective marketing. 
and it doesn't have to have the call to action. You have, they have to know how to get a hold of you. They have to know what would they need to do if they wanted to contact you. Right. But it's got a timelessness to it because people that do geographic farming, you might farm an area and five years later, somebody who's been getting those little mailing mm -hmm. pieces or whatever, now they're ready to sell. We're going to call Freddie. He's the one who knows all about this. Yeah, we've seen his mail for five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he, he must be the expert. All right. So that's the idea, not telling them every time, you must call me today. So I, that's just the difference. So we, we promote when we believe the market will be most receptive to the promotions. Like, I don't know that sending Christmas cards is going to do anything but get lost in the shuffle. Um, yeah. So that kind of stuff. So in December, we don't, after the first couple, 10 days, two weeks of December, we cut off all advertising. Hmm. And so we don't radio and farming? Every, all of it. We all cut it, it all okay. off. There's no, there's no reason, in my opinion, yeah. to do it. Uh, and then January, we start again. So I see. Th those would be examples. Okay. And then as far as your organization, how many support staff do you have right now? Let me think. Uh, I have five six admin mm -hmm. and then I have four five I, I think six commission salespeople maybe five I can't remember right now okay but five or six outside salespeople and so these outside sales they go to they work with buyers and sellers or uh, they have one of them hats? only does listings and two of them do buyers and sellers I see. It, it's an interesting thing at one time I I believed that having the listings and buyer agents completely separate mm -hmm. was the best way to go. Um, I've learned since then that one of the, we've had, we have, I have, like JC has been with me 21 or 22 years. Oh, he's pretty loyal. Huh? He's pretty loyal. Yeah, yeah, he's, this is starting to work out for yeah. us. <laughs> uh, and he, all he does is listings. That's been yeah. true from day one. But my other two listers, uh, Eva and uh, Elaine, I was, Eva's been with me 10 years and Elaine's been with me about four years now. And I was amazed at how competent Eva became so quickly. And I was stunned at how competent uh, Elaine became so quickly. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to Wendy, my, my business partner, and she said, uh, well, it's because they're buyer agents. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, they're out in the marketplace every day. So if they need to go price a house that's 275, they've been looking at houses and showing other people houses mm -hmm. that are 275. They have a pretty damn good idea of what 275 buys. And it's correct. Their ability to price a home yeah. uh, was so astounding to me, so competent, so quickly. Well, it's because they also work buyers. Right. So uh, we then, we've made a decision now we won't have anyone just dedicated as a lister. We would convert buyer agents. but. See, uh, by, to, to become a lister on my team, it, it has to be someone who has their group hat on thoroughly as well as competent at being a buyer agent. So I want someone who's competent. See, a buyer agent doesn't have the ability to ruin the organization by bringing in crap because it, it stops at the lender if they have a crap buyer. Oh, I see. A lister who could take a listing that never should have been taken mm -hmm. does have the ability, uh, if they're only self-serving, like, well, I'm here anyway, I'll just take this, when in fact the correct thing to do would be to get up and walk yeah, out. Yeah, walk out. Uh, and don't take it. Uh, so I've seen that from both sides. So I want a lister, someone who has their group hat on as well as their post hat on, so that they, they feel like, well, I'm not going to do that to the organization. It doesn't benefit the group. Mm -hmm. So that's a difference. Um, when's the last time you went to a listing appointment? That would have been 2001. Okay. Okay. So you probably wouldn't be very good at the table today. I don't think that's true. I actually, <laughs> what I'm doing though, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think I would be excellent at the table. I'm just not bothering to go. I yeah. don't need to. Um, what I do spend the bulk of my time in the office doing is conversions. People that yeah. call in that want to talk to find out how much do you charge, this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that's what I shine at. And so I actually am doing the equivalent of a listing presentation. Well, and I think, so this is really a key point because a lot of the guys right now, they're, they're so adamant about hiring inside sales agents, outside sales agents, mm -hmm. right? Compartmentalizing all this and that. And we were in a meeting when you announced 
that you're back on the phones and your yes, conversion yes, rates yeah. tripled. Yeah, was yeah. it was it tripled? What was I can't remember. What I know is the pe- person I had doing it was god awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't confronted that, and we had been losing a tremendous amount of business mm-hmm. because it wasn't me or Wendy doing that part. And now it's yeah. only me or Wendy that does it. So that. you're we, the only two calling? Just her or me, period. Okay. And now it's different if someone calls in, and let's say uh, Cassandra Jean answered the phone, and somebody says, we're hoping to get an appointment for 4 o'clock tomorrow. Well, now that— the, can they just go right ahead and book it and go, I'll have Russell call you when he comes in just to answer any questions you mm-hmm. have. Yeah, that's fine if they just want an appointment. But someone who needs to be chatted with, I do it or Wendy does it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome because it shows that you're not too big to handle any of the tasks. No. And, and one of the things that we talk a lot about Craig Proctor is that the ISA is the hardest job to hire. And clearly, right, I mean, having Russell do it, that's, it's going to be better I think having... that there's some stuff. Here's here's what I can tell you. Yeah. So can almost anything be delegated? Yes, mm-hmm. almost. Yeah, we're actually going to go. That was the next question right here. Almost. But there's two things that I found you cannot correctly, successfully delegate for mm-hmm. long. One would be quality control. Any organization that misses the qual division is one headed for a future crash. Yeah. If the quality of service, if the care factor for the client, the care factor for how things are done isn't being monitored, and the organization and the product will soon turn to crap. That's just a fact. If you look at companies that are screamingly successful, let's say Apple, Mm -hmm. one of the things is not just their technology, it's their service. If you have a problem with an Apple product, just I'm just using that as an example. It's not an issue of is it under warranty, it's, is it any this or that. You can contact Apple, and if there's something wrong, they're going to work on it. And, they're going, and they keep working on it until it's fixed. They mm-hmm. don't have the, well, you just got a bad one. <laughs> That's not part of the equation. Yeah. Same with BMW. They just you know, use that. Have I ever had problems? Yes. Were they fixed? Yes, they were. Mm-hmm. Um, and the factory gets involved. and goes. But, but the point is, quality control so don't, you don't try to delegate that the other one that i have uh, to me and i know there i know there'll be people listening to this that disagree and i don't care i think they're wrong don't delegate lead generation when people are recruiting someone for a team so that they can get somebody else to lead generate mm-hmm. i think if they can successfully lead generate what in god's name do they need you for right like if, if, they, if they can successfully lead generate, mm-hmm. lead generation is one of the skills that an agent must have to be successful, but it's so much more important than all of the other skills combined that if somebody is good enough at lead generation, they could be awful at a whole bunch of other things and still succeed. Yeah. If they're awful at lead generation, it won't matter how good they are at everything else, they're going to fail. Yeah. And notice that I'm saying lead conversion that's a, is a companion skill. That's not the same thing. Mm-hmm. But I believe that if the lead conversion stuff is fairly simple, like buyer, buyer deals, I'm not interested in personally working on converting buyer leads mm-hmm. ever. Not this lifetime. I haven't yeah. been in 20 years, and I'm not going to be. Uh, because I believe my buyer agents do it every bit as good, if not better, than me. Right. But when it comes to converting listing leads, I honestly, I don't know of someone who does it better than me. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that out of some idiotic ego statement. I just, this is what I do. Right. So if I get a chance to talk to them, I realize now, as I used to delegate it completely. For years, I didn't do it. I, that was a horrid, horrible mistake. I was giving away huge amounts of money on a sort of in an invisible way because if I'd have talked to them, there were deals we'd have gotten right. that we don't get. Costs. Yeah. Yeah. Lost opportunities. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so, what is the biggest lesson you've learned in your career? God, it's so simple. It would be care, uh, the care factor. If you said, like, if you looked back in your life when you were in school, mm-hmm. you might have had one, maybe two teachers 
that were that was the best teacher she was the best he was the best and if you look at what made them the best it wouldn't be they were the smartest of all the teachers or the most knowledgeable of all the teachers it was that they cared the most about the student actually learning mm-hmm. so if you look what makes a great agent truly is I've, I've met people I would call she's really good she's really really good is she brilliant no she's really nice yeah but she cares about her client she cares about the outcome so if you look what makes a good mom somebody who cares I mean it's the same thing yeah. it's exactly the same thing so that care factor and you can get stuff so automated and so uh, I'm not going to touch this kind of thing or I'm not going to do that that you get away from the care and you by the way get away from quality control at the mm-hmm. same time but I think caring and like when a person stops caring about the outcome of things in their own business or in their own life, they're on a toboggan ride down. Right. So I think if I had to pick one thing, it's caring. But you could come back to, if you say, what's the most important thing? In, in for anybody, I'm just listening to this. Because if you say, what's the most important thing in any business? Getting and keeping customers. Mm-hmm. Any business. Yeah. Any business. Well, what then, What? how does care go into that? Totally. Do you care how good you are at getting and keeping customers? Especially in today's yeah. day and age. Yeah. Right. With all the online reviews and yeah. so on. So uh, what are your top three or five lead, so- lead sources? Like top three or five? or Lead sources. Well, probably for us, it's television, number one. Uh, radio's number two. Uh, and we spend more on TV. We spend about 400000 just on television. Oh, really? Yeah, just, okay. just for TV. And about two hundred on radio, and another two hundred on the uh, mailings, the, the mm-hmm. farm areas, and the farms probably number three. And then we probably do forty to fifty repeat and referral deals a year. Mm-hmm. So that those would be the pecking order. Okay, simple enough. Uh, and then Jared Jones in Florida wants to know: Are there? You already mentioned like the time of year is that you won't you won't advertise. Are there days of the week you avoid being on radio or TV, or is there like a a minimum or a maximum? frequency well that you try to hit yeah you don't want if you're buying radio or television ads you do not want to be on the air more than ever more than once in the same hour because mm-hmm. you're getting the same audience yeah and uh and you hit diminishing returns i've never found it productive to advertise on holidays to pay if they if the stations say we're going to give you some free spots live it up but in terms <laughs> of pay, paid spots yeah. If you're advertising yourself as a service company on radio or television, run these spots strictly on news. Do not put it on regular entertainment shows. Mm -hmm. Uh, In this day and age, like TiVo now has a button I can push to eliminate all the commercials in any TV spot. But hardly anyone records the news to watch later. (laughs) Uh, You understand, nobody's recording the news to watch it later. And with uh, radio, it's the same thing. I have found that uh, stations that appeal to older people uh, tend to work okay on music. I specifically uh, like soft rock, uh, no, not soft rock, uh, classic rock, mm-hmm. classic rock type stuff. Oddly enough, works just fine. Hmm. Interesting. So. Okay. Um, if you were to start all over again, would you do anything differently? Yes, I would have become a lister sooner. I would have uh, just uh, gone, started instead of waiting 13 years to go, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life, and I'm going to be a lister. Because if you look at, is it possible to do a huge number of buyer deals and be successful? Yeah, there's three or four people, maybe maybe a dozen people in the country doing that. Mm -hmm. But is it as stable as a listing-based business? No, because usually the people who are doing a ton of buyer deals like that. There's a guy out of Melbourne, Florida, uh, who does it through internet leads, uh, brilliant guy. Um, Mitch? uh, Mitch, Mitch Reback. Yeah. Very bright guy, nice guy. Very sharp guy. Uh, So Mitch is, he's doing, last I knew, about 330 deals a year. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's in a resort community, so it doesn't, it's not quite the same as like for a Phoenix market. Right, second homes. Yes, exactly. there's a, a a bright guy here in town doing uh, uh, Jason Mitchell, mm-hmm. and, and he's doing tons of buyer deals. He's number one in armless for buyer deals. Mm-hmm. But the f- 
problem there, in my opinion. This is not some snipe snipe at him because I don't. I have nothing but respect. I wish I was doing that well when I was that young. Yeah. Uh, it's a single source. And any time you have a single source that's not under your direct control, you don't have complete stability. Mm -hmm. Like when I had one source, when I first started doing radio ads, I was being given the ads for free in exchange for writing and producing comedy, and that was at KSLX. So the sales manager and the general manager could jerk me around any damn time they wanted. All right. Once I was paying for the ads at KTAR, I had a, my first of all my business skyrocketed, but second, by the time I went, by the time I had two stations, if one of them wanted to try to screw me on the rates, I go good. I'm not buying any. I'll buy from them. Yeah. So I was no longer had this single source, but when I first started, I did have a single source, and that was KSLX. That's a tenuous position. It's no different than an REO agent mm -hmm. who had this one bank that was funneling. Oh, I don't know. Uh, 200 deals a year, and all yeah. of a sudden they go, we're not using you now. The loss mitigator didn't like your attitude last month. <laughs> well, it's how it happened. That's exactly happened. how it happened, yeah. And all of a sudden, somebody who was doing 90 million a year is now back to 5 million a year. Mm -hmm. So if you have a single source for your business that's not under your direct control, it's different if it's a geographic farm. Mm -hmm. You say, my farm's how I get my business. That's different yeah. because you can do something about it. Well, that's listings again. Yes, it's exactly. Buyers. So. It, it, buyers see hardly any customer is actually ever shopping for an agent. This is an interesting point, and it's usually missed. Sellers do actually interview agents mm -hmm. because they're the ones paying for agents. But buyers are seldom interviewing agents. There may be some reload company or something, but yeah. if you looked at 95% of the buyers, and I think it's probably 99%, I don't know the right number, but it's almost all, they're not looking for a certain agent. They're not looking for someone to love. Mm. Uh, they, the, no one's not like, I hope we, you know, we're going to go buy a new car. I hope we meet a really nifty car salesman today. <laughs> they don't give a crap. They're just looking for a house, and they're willing to tolerate the agent to get to see the house. Yeah. It's at that point that the good agent converts them into actually liking them and trusting them, and that person then becomes the agent. If you look at Zillow, if you look at all the online lead sources, have they so caused one single house to sell that wouldn't have sold anyway? No. No. Nope. But they changed who sold it. They changed who wrote the contract dramatically mm -hmm. by, by getting the leads and they yeah, mastered yeah. search. And, and then the agent, we're going to sell this lead to you for $43. I'll take it. And the guy sells the house. Mm -hmm. He goes, I got a good deal. I'm going to keep buying more. Right. But they changed who wrote the offer. But the co consumer is not better or worse for it. No. It's, it doesn't, didn't change anything. So I hope that answers yeah, that. Yeah, no, whether it was Joe or Bill or mm -hmm. Sally, they got the house. Mm -hmm. um, okay. How has, or oh, actually, you know, I want to talk about another topic. You've talked mm -hmm. how to be a great listing agent. Yes. So, Russell, I want to become a great listing agent. What do I have to do? Go on a lot of appointments. It's the most important thing of all. It's stage time. It's the equivalent of a comedian getting stage time. Mm -hmm. You can practice in your living room forever. You can do uh, drills with your fellow agents of handling objections all you want to. But until you actually go into the house for someone that wants to actually sell a house and practice on them, you will not have any real experience. Yeah. All problems in getting listings are either at the table or in getting to the table. All. There's no other type of issue. Yeah. If you have been on less than 50 appointments, that's my number, if you've been on less than 50 appointments, you have an incredibly crappy listing presentation, <laughs> no matter what you think. Okay. If I've insulted you, too bad. Uh, you need to practice more. Yeah. You don't become world class because you took five listings in a year. You actually are sloppy at it. You don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're not doing right. Correct. And people who say they list 98% or 9 out of 10, they're either working such an incredibly fantastic sphere of influence mm -hmm. and only go on the appointment once it's nailed down that they're going to list. But it's a stupid thing to say to people. It's a cretinous thing to say 
for a couple of reasons. One, the people listening will never be able to match that number. And part of the reason they'll never be able to match that number is it's a complete lie. Uh, it's like they, the Cosmopolitan model. Yeah, it, it's just complete crap. Let, let me give you some real numbers. In the 15 years running up to the run-up in prices, my ratios at the table ran consecutively, just consistently, between 56 and 58 percent. We, we went on an appointment, we took the listing 56 to 58 percent of the time. This year, because we have loosened our standards considerably on what qualifies for an appointment, it's almost mm -hmm. what time's good for you folks, not quite, but pretty close, mm -hmm. we are running just a little bit under 44 percent. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? So. We're running between 43 and 44 percent year to date on interviews to listings taken because listings when listings get more scarce this is always true they're easier to sell mm -hmm. when listings are more abundant they're harder to sell right so right now with listings in the point the price points that people really want to buy their listings are actually fairly scarce mm -hmm. translate we've loosened up considerably on what qualifies for an appointment. They're interested in talking about selling. Good. What time? We'll come over. Right. Absolutely. So are we, and people claim to bat a thousand. I go, they're just idiots. I mean, when someone says this, and it's an ego-based type statement because they have this, they want to, they're sort of proud at their fantastic ratios, but they're nonsense. If a new agent say, let's pretend you've only listed one or two houses. Are you going to hit 44% if you're talking to strangers? Probably not. Probably not. No. And you didn't fail. Like if you got one in five, good. Go. Keep going to appointments. Right. Because the secret, coming back to the specific question, Steve, how do you get really good? By doing it a lot. I, I, I equate it to learning to ride a bicycle. You would never learn to correctly, competently, to ride a bike by reading books on bike riding. Mm-hmm or listening to someone explain it. You have to get on the bike. Yeah. You have to get on the bike, and you're going to fall. <laughs> it's just the deal. Right. And until you're willing to do that, you can't learn to do it. Right. And I, I have seen over the years, I have personally talked to, and I know this sounds outrageous, but thousands of agents who say things like, I don't really like listings, I like buyers better. That's a failure viewpoint, number one. But what makes it wrong is they can't stand rejection. They're a people pleaser personality. That makes sense. They can't stand rejection. And they find that buyers, since look, what you go to a buyer and you go, I'm going to help you find a good lender that's trustworthy. I'm going to uh, search for you and do everything you need on your schedule, by the way, folks. <laughs> and uh, find you a house and walk you through all kinds of things. And if there's any questions that I don't know the answer to, I'll find someone who does and get back to you. Oh, and I won't cost you a dime. Would you like to work with me? What's for them not to like? <laughs> I mean, seriously, from the consumer point of view. As long as you're presentable. Yeah, yeah. Don't smell bad, have a lockbox key and have a, what, what's not to like from the consumer point of view? Mm -hmm. Now let's be, I don't know, uh, a, an agent on a $300,000 home. And just for the sake of conversation, you go in and go, hi, I'm going to put a sign in your yard, a lockbox on your house, and I want you to write me a check for $18,000. How about it, folks? Ready? <laughs> yeah. See, <laughs> but get the difference. Well, now that customer, consumer, client, whatever, well, we're going to see what else other people can do for us. All right. Because now they've got some, because they're the ones paying. They got skin in the game. Yes. So it's a very different equation. Mm -hmm. So does it take more competence to be a listing agent? Yes. Does that make it harder? Not if you know what you're doing, but right. if you don't know what you're doing, it's almost impossible. Yeah. And the biggest single barrier to becoming a competent listing agent is factually thinking you already are one. Yeah. Nothing to learn. Yeah. So. The, 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 the day you figured it out is the day you start slowing down. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that's come up a lot, um, in fact, Kenny and I, Kenny Claus and I talked about this uh -huh. last week, 
was technology and how it's impacting everything. Uh -huh. And I know that you've talked about all these, every time the market's good, we got these 100% clowns coming in and then, or not 100% discount yeah, clowns yeah. come in. Mm -hmm. And then once the tide pulls out, they pull out they too. They pull out too. So I wanna see, has technology this time impacted your business at all? Well, I don't think technology is the right term. I, I think that technology, uh, I don't, I, first of all, technology in any form mm -hmm. in this day and age levels the playing field more so than gives anyone an advantage because there isn't much in the way of technology the most nincompoop agent can't get. I mean, you could take the poorest, you could take the brokerage firm that has the least agents, the least money, and does the least business. There's almost nothing in the way of technology that they don't have, just like the big giants. Yeah. I mean, so there's not some, my God, uh, this proprietary software or this something that becomes a game changer like that. Like there was a time, and I know it sounds funny to say it now, there was a time the fax machine changed the game. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> it was a game changer. Uh, prior to that. It was a game changer. Th that it was. It factually was. And then email came along and went, oh, my God. So the, the, uh, the Internet didn't exist when I started. Fax machines didn't exist when I started. Uh, it, it, so there's some technology, but once everyone had a fax machine, it was no longer, there, there was a point, there was a time people would promote they have a fax machine. That sounds insane <laughs> and stupid today, but the idea you can fax it to us at this number was, my God, that company's, they, they have a fax, but all of them didn't. That's they're, what you have to they're get. They're in the forefront of technology. They're in the forefront <laughs> of technology. Now, I don't think there is some technology. If you, if you say, well, let's take Keller Williams or Colwell Banker, what, what the hell can they get in the way of technology that some agent from West USA or HomeSmart can't and they go, I'm going to get one too. Yeah. It, I don't think there is something. So I don't really think it's the technology is the issue. What happens, and it's always happened, it, ha it was happening when I got in the business in 1978, it was happening. When you have a hyperextended seller market, this is what causes it, mm -hmm. a hyperextended seller market, it always brings out the we do nothing for less crowd. We're going to charge less. That's a great name. It is. It's much better than <laughs> discount, by the way, for positioning. The we do nothing for less crowd. They sprout. They just simply sprout. When someone brings that up to me, here's what I tell them. Whatever those companies are charging, and I don't care, why pay that much? Why pay the price Purple Bricks is offering? You can go to Congress Realty, and they'll list it for $500 for you. Or less. Or less. Is it less now? I think it's two ninety nine. Well, I just, I'm just i still using the number 500 yeah. so I'm out, of, I'm out of date. But but understand, they don't care. If, if, you, if Let's say $300, they'll put it in MLS, mm -hmm. and you can cancel any time because they don't care. I'm not picking on them. Right. If you look at historically, when did that company do well? In a market where everything was selling anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's not something to fear. It's not something to be spooked by. The, they always sprout. I'll give you a specific example that to me is fantastic. In 2006, I did 104 million, and I think it was 406 deals. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, I'm going to do a juxtaposition with my office, me, and Help You Sell. Mm -hmm. Help You Sell at that time had 17 offices here in the Valley. Oh. That's just, here's, here's what I want you to get. I had an office that was approximately 900 square feet. Help You Sell had 17 branch locations, franchise locations here in the Valley. And I'm not picking on Help You Sell. By the end of 2008, my business had been cut in half, and it was right around 52 million, 51 and some change. Mm -hmm. I was doing more business out of my office than all 17 help you sell offices combined. Wow. I just want to just let that sink in because this is not to go get a load of me. It's to go get a load of when the buyer when the, when the market's so good that the perception is agents are a commodity 
if I can get someone to list it for less, I'm going there. Yeah. That goes away almost instantly as soon as it shifts to a buyer market. Mm -hmm. It goes away instantly. What's going to happen here in town? If they want to sue me for this, I want them to be my guest. Purple Bricks will, will go broke here advertising. Mm -hmm. it, on, on their margins, they will go broke here advertising. Purple Bricks and Homey have each done about 10 or 12 million year to date. Total, very good. total. On the margins they're working on, how long does that last? And that's now. In a good market. Yes, in a seller market. Yeah. Once the market changes, they're all gone. Right. They're all gone, just like Congress Realty went from, I don't remember, it was some hundred and something million down to like four million. I don't remember the exact numbers, mm -hmm. but, but the point is it goes away because then the consumer's not simply looking for who can do it the cheapest, but who can do it at all. Who can do it right. Yeah, exactly. So do I think this is something like, oh my God, so-and-so is here now. I don't care. It won't matter. Yeah. Who those companies, if you say, who does Open Door actually disrupt and put out of business to some degree? It's not agents. No, it's not agents at all. It might spook them, mm -hmm. but in mecha mecha on a mechanical level, someone like Doug Hopkins. Because when he buys a house, he actually needs to make a real profit. Yeah. So he's a good guy. This is, I'm not picking on him. He's, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a good guy. My point is... It's his business model. It's his business model. He actually has to buy it cheap enough. He can't pay what they're paying. No, he can't. And he's not going to. So he just has to pull out of the market until they're, they're not doing that. Right. So, Interesting. Uh, who coaches Russell? I don't know that anyone coaches me, per se. I've never had a coach in that sense. Um, I've had people that have helped me immensely. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend uh, Dean Selvey. Uh, Dean and I have been having lunch uh, about once a month for, oh, I would say a little over 30 years now. It's starting to work out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so he and I have sort of mentored each other. Mm -hmm. It's been a two-way street, and I know I've helped Dean, but Dean's helped me uh, yeah. at, at least as much over the years. Super sharp guy. Yeah, uh, so it's stuff like that. And Wendy, my partner, because when it's, it's harder. I mean, I look at Dean sometimes because he doesn't have someone he can rely on. See, if I have a, well, let's say if Wendy has a crappy day or a crappy week or something happens, I can talk to her and fix it. Yeah. If I do, some, if I'm upset about something, five, 10 minutes with her and I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and so it, 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 when you have someone that you can explain it to and then you know they just heard you or they can tell you, well, why would you wanna work on that? Oh yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, it makes it easier. Uh, but a mentor, not really. I've been more, uh, I, I've had to figure out so many things on my own because the mentors that I had were idiots, uh, truly. Yeah. I, I think that it became a benefit to other people that some stuff I had to figure out because I will take pricing. I honest to God assumed that it was something I just hadn't grasped until I realized that most of the technology taught to agents on how to price a home was complete crap. Uh, the idea, well, let's take price per square foot. Mm -hmm. If that's all you had to know, seriously, if that's all you had to know was price per square foot, and people talk about it endlessly like they know what they're talking about. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, if that were actually a correct way to just use that number to price a home, just, just get this one point then Zillow would almost always be correct. Mm -hmm. That's true. They would almost always be correct, and yet they're almost always incorrect. And I'm not picking on Zillow. My point is, is that there's more involved than just robotically taking price per square foot. You can't make any juxtaposition between two-story and single-story. Mm -hmm. If there's more than a 20% difference in size, it must be tossed out. You can't even use it at all. Uh, if you're crossing busy streets, like Zillow uses a radius search going out a quarter of a mile, you've just entered, you, you may as well just make up a number by throwing darts. Yeah. You'd get just about the same result. Now, this doesn't mean it can't be done. So if you made a statement, if the list price sales price ratio in MLS and ARMLIS is almost always around 97 and a half percent, 
This says that all the agents that are selling houses, almost all of them, including the ones where you have these jumbo, they listed it for two and a half million, it was really only worth one and a half million, that ratio still cumulatively is at about 97 and a half percent. And knowing that if you know that, then you could clearly see most agents do know how to correctly price a home. Yeah. Now, th- that said, that was observable to me. The part I couldn't figure out is how the hell are they doing it? Because when I first became a lister, I thought, I don't get it. You can't do that. It doesn't equate. Here's what I know. They don't know what they know. If they did, they could teach it. Yeah. If they knew what they knew, they could teach it. But when you ask some experienced listing agent, well, how do you know that's the right number? Well, I just sort of know it. Okay. How do you sort of know it? What data exactly are you looking at to know that? Well, you use the price per square foot. No, you didn't. You fig- you looked at that after you figured out the price. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, see, yeah. you understand? Mm-hmm. And that is what I actually figured out. Here's how it's done. And I'm not going to try to take the time right now, but if somebody goes on my uh, agent blog, if you want to know it, it's at number one, that's N-U-M-B-E-R, numeral one, homeagent.com, number one, homeagent.com, and look for the seminar on how to price a home. It's about a two-hour seminar, but it's all there, everything you need to know. And, how is it? Huh? I didn't know that. Oh. That's great. Yeah, great it, resource. it's free. You take it, it use yeah. it. It's, but it's, it's honestly, it it's, gets away from the price per square foot because that is not what, when I actually was pricing homes myself, it was interesting. I could tell the difference between 200, 205, and 210 and be right. And I was right, correct, endlessly, right up until about 2005. Late 2004, I started getting stupid. And I continued <laughs> to be stupid. And I, you understand, because I had never at that time taken in to consideration supply demand. Yeah. Because it was flat. Mm-hmm. I just. It, well, you're majority of your career it was flat it was predictable yep so now what we what i look at first is supply and demand and there's no better reference than the book shift by gary keller Mm -hmm. where it talks about six months as a balanced supply four months would be quote unquote normal supply Uh, three months shows visible upward price pressure two months is a hot seller market one month or less is an insane seller market. And eight months shows downward pressure on prices. Yep. That's all in the seminar if they want right. to hear it. So, Okay. Uh, where do you see your business in three to five years? At least double, if not triple, what I'm doing now. And what causes you to say that? We want to. <laughs> <laughs> Goes back to seeing the goal. Yeah, yeah. Wanting the goal. Yeah. You know, let's go back to that, uh, the seeing, wanting, and getting. Because mm-hmm. there are a lot of people mm-hmm. that want something but they don't have the motivation or well, they don't totally want it so and that's that the, unconditional even, so when you go to that some when you go to that website number one agent home.com there's a couple other posts one there's a there's a seminar on goals mm-hmm. it's actually it might be called find out why but that's a seminar on goals mm-hmm. and the other thing i would recommend is in the search box in the upper right hand corner Uh, Put in these two words, enemy, line. That's enemy and the word line, L-I-N-E. And there'll be two blog posts that'll come up. One's called enemy line. One's called ninja ninja genius and the enemy. But anyway, read those two posts and do the exercise. Mm -hmm. Because when a person says, I want X, I don't know. I want a red Corvette. Let's just use that. I want a red Corvette and they can't get it, and they can't move confidently forward toward getting that red Corvette. It doesn't matter whether it's a red Corvette, 20 closed deals a year, 150 closed deals a year, or a new shiny home, whatever it is, doesn't matter. But I'm just gonna use red Corvette. When the person can't move toward the red Corvette, they have a conflicting goal or a conflicting thought in their own head. People that drive Corvettes are pricks. People who are in a Corvette, people don't like them. Mm -hmm. Um, Those cars just attract attention of the wrong kind. Or whatever thought. I'm just using this. just Head trash. It's just crap. Yeah. And they're carting the crap with them. 
So every time they think of the goal that they claim they want, they're also mulling over this stuff that's just poison, it's just toxic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter how it got in their head, it's in there now. The answer how it got there, usually when they were tired or hungry. You know, if you've had children, you know that 95% of the time when the kid's squawking about something, you can fix it by feeding them and putting them to bed. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I know. scream at them. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> exactly. You seem like a screamer. No, I'm joking. So you look and go, I, I've seen agents literally brag that they haven't eaten breakfast or lunch. They've only had coffee all day, and it's 3 in the afternoon. I, I've actually heard them sort of like, aren't I? Uh, Superhuman. Yeah, just amazing what I'm doing by making sure my blood sugar is low, by making sure I'll be easily provoked by the slightest little <laughs> screwball thing. Yeah. Uh, so actually, there'd be something to be said for, and, and this came out in Gary Keller's book, The One Thing, when he talked about, uh, which I couldn't over-recommend that book. Oh, it's an unbelievable book. Just amazing for all the correct technology and myth-busting on gold, but mm -hmm. the part where he talked about uh, uh, prisoners up for parole, the ones who were least likely to get paroled, was the people that came before the parole board just before lunch or just before closing time mm -hmm. when the when the when the parole people parole board would be at their lowest blood sugar level the people most likely to be paroled were the ones that came in first right after those people had had breakfast or lunch or lunch and yeah. and so you have this and you go did it have much to do with the uh, goodness or badness of the prisoner nope so you you there's a lesson there um if you have, if you're rested and fed, you're going to do better mm -hmm. on anything. Uh, th then you get into finding those toxic thoughts and those, those, those two blog posts on enemy lying or how to isolate the thoughts that you have in your head that are specific to your exact goal. So if you take your goal and you make it an affirmation that you already have it, I have a red Corvette. Then you take down and write down every thought that you have and make a list. Mm -hmm. And I've had people ask me, well, what do you do with that list? You burn it? No. Why would you want to keep a list of negative ideas? Well, how about this? You're making a list of ideas you've had in your own head that will keep you from achieving your goal. <laughs> how about that? It's a list of stuff you've found that has effectively been working mm -hmm. to stop you from achieving the goals you're telling me you want. Yeah. So you'd want that list in case those thoughts come back. And guess when they're going to come back? When you're tired or hungry. Interesting. Uh, what would happen to your business if the market took a dip? The market's always taking a dip in or a surge in one direction or another. One of the main things I learned from reading Shift is it was a wake up to me to see that the market could shift this way and then it could shift that way. What I've realized since then, thanks to uh, a, the, bl the blessing that came to Phoenix named Michael Orr, mm -hmm. what I've learned since he's then- He's not here anymore. Well, but he still does the presence Trump. Still here. Yeah, he's, he's still, his presence is here. He's yeah. back in England, but yeah. I, he, he's so wonderful and his data is so spot on yeah. and it's so, so well thought out. I wish I listened to it uh, when the market was going up. When you predicted a twenty yeah, yeah. percent, I wish I listened. Yeah, yeah. It would just it's it's it, your my hindsight's perfect too. I want you to know that. I, it, it. What I've learned is that the market is constantly shifting. Mm -hmm. It never stops shifting. It's always dipping or some part of it. So you could have had a few short years ago, Arcadia was booming, and then yeah. you have these areas around. There's something always happening. And it's always in one direction or another, and it never stops. There's the appearance that you could go, well, this is very stable now. Yeah, it can seem that way, but there are still areas that are having shifts mm -hmm. uh, in one way or another. There's some parts of the valley being developed. Some other parts are being neglected. It's, there's, it's not even. Yeah. There's no national market. There's no... Like what's happening in Ames, Iowa, isn't what's happening here. I, I, I mean, I have people, I know people there, there, but I don't need to study it. Just right. here. Yeah, that's the one that matters. Uh, what is your superpower? My superpower? Mm -hmm. Probably. 
Besides a sense of humor. Yeah, it, it's besides my sense of humor. It's the recognition that when I don't know something, being aware that I don't know, um, that actually helps me a lot because there's some stuff that I'm extremely knowledgeable about and uh, very certain of my data. And there's other stuff that might seem to some casual observer, well, that's not the same as that. No, <laughs> no, and I don't know a damn thing about it. Yeah. Um, in fact, I have uh, very little information that I've evaluated and I don't know, I don't know. And so I find myself, uh, the more I do know, realizing more what I don't know. Uh, it's, yeah. it, it's not a matter of being stupid, but there are areas, I don't care how smart someone is, that you go, I don't know. Uh, and that's the answer. Yeah. And I think that uh, this was hard for me to learn on prices because at one time I thought, well, I know the price of a house. Right up until the point where it was hitting me in the face, like, I don't know the price of the house. It looked to me like it was worth two and a quarter, but we just sold it for 275 cash. That was 2005. Mm -hmm. And I thought it seemed too high at two and a quarter to even be listed. And yet 275 and it was done all cash. And I thought, this is unbelievable. And I just took that attribute. It was unbelievable. I don't have to believe it. But eventually I'm going, this is happening. This mm -hmm. isn't anecdotal data anymore. So when I see some trend happening, when we see some market moving in a certain direction, like our saving grace in 2006 was we had our listings on big, big boards in the office. And when our contract, when, when our listings ballooned mm -hmm. in early 2006, probably around April, our boards were full. We had to keep adding new listing boards because we had so many listings. Our contract board wasn't booming proportionately. And that told us at once, we're bringing crap in the door. Mm -hmm. We're overpriced. We need to tighten up on prices. And this was when listed at any price, it's fine. No, it's not. They're not selling. They're not selling. The market's slowing and we're, we're doing a lot of business. But it was by looking just at those two, two mm -hmm. things, we could clearly see we're overpricing listings. We have to tighten up right now, yeah. which is why we had such a good year yeah. by being able to see that. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing. I would definitely say that is a very valuable superpower. <laughs> uh, so I haven't seen you promote your seminars as much, and I want to take this opportunity here. If you're, are you still doing them? I am not doing them. Oh, you're not? I stopped doing them because okay. I was on a course, a Scientology course that was taking so much of my time and after I wrapped that up, I had some physical problems, mm. which I'm now are all completely behind me. Okay, I had good. surgery, and I was, but I was in the hospital a couple of times. And so I just never got back to it. And what I'm now looking at doing um, is I just, because I haven't had time to, to, to physically do them because mm -hmm. I've just been so busy. What I'm going to do um, is something, this is going out that Facebook Live, I presume. Oh yeah, we're live right now. Yeah. So do it, it's on Facebook. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm gonna start doing something like that. Yeah. I don't know even mechanically how to do it, but I thought it won't take me that long to learn. Right. And so I'm gonna start doing some kind of a, the seminars mm -hmm. uh, via Facebook Live. I'm just oh, not awesome. ready to start doing it. Be, that'd be great, but my yeah. point is, I, it's gonna be easier for me to do that mm -hmm. than to, uh, w we've moved the office, and I used to have the, uh, uh, we, we upstairs at mm -hmm. John Hall in Realty One, and we had that Kiva room which we had pretty much full run of whenever we needed it. It was could, nice. It was like a courtroom. It was really beautiful. Yeah, just great beautiful. Setup. So the office, Realty One, is now downstairs, and so am I. I have my own private office as a separate thing. I'm a branch manager now. I want people. Oh, congratulations. To, thank you. It's a big deal for me. <laughs> it's like a, my name's right on the door. Uh, but we don't really have a great space unless I were to go over to uh, older public title, which is like three buildings over. And I thought, oh, that's going to be a pain in the ass in the mm -hmm. summer walking over there. And so I just it just came to me about 10 days ago th that the thing to do would be to do the seminars online via Facebook. Mm -hmm. And that way people from all over the country could come to them anyway. And they could ask questions live while we do them, yep. uh, just like you're going getting that now, uh, which was always part of the, the success of those seminars that I, when I gave them live, because... Otherwise, there'd be no, I could just, I have video. They're all, I have them all on my, my that blog, no has, uh, uh, number one agent com. But sometimes people would hear something and they just didn't quite get it. Mm -hmm. They just, they, they almost had it. 
And it was the advantage of them being able to go, wait, wait a minute, can you help me understand blah, blah, blah. Like, I remember one time uh, I was given a talk. It was on the conditions, and it's a wonderful uh, talk. And, and there was a guy there. He's a very b big agent, and he, this was his third time at that seminar. And he said, there was something I said, and I don't remember what it was, but he said, well, I know what you're saying is correct because you're saying it. And uh, I, he said, but I don't, I don't quite get it. And he wasn't making a joke, mm -hmm. and, and he was sincere. And I said, no, you don't know it's correct because I'm saying it. What you know is that I said it. And you might know that I said it emphatically. You might know that I said it with complete conviction. But that doesn't make it correct. There are a lot of information people are blathering that they're yeah. quite convinced of, uh, the, uh, the validity of it, and it's complete crap. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't know. It's, you, you know it's true when you can observe it to be true. Then you know it. And so one of the things I really liked about th those talks is I could actually see the people, and I could understand the question, and I could sort of anticipate, well, you're trying to grasp X. Yes. Okay. Well, good. Right. And then I could explain it because I wasn't talking about something I didn't understand. I was talking about something they didn't understand. It might be a talk that I've given 50, 60, 70 times, but this is their first exposure to it. Mm -hmm. And so I realized probably the simplest thing is to do a, like a Facebook Live type of situation, and people can then get it. I mean, yeah. and, and I can disseminate it more widely. So right. that's probably what I'm going to do next. Okay. Yeah. So thanks uh, for asking. Yeah, because it was helpful for me. You know, I went to them uh, many, many years ago. So, uh, what would be the best way for our listeners to get a hold of you besides, you know, calling you and your commercials? Uh, well, don't please don't all call me because I won't be able to talk. I don't know how many people are listening right now. But yeah. If there's three hundred or two hundred or five hundred, uh, normally by the end of this, we have somewhere in the hundreds or thousand plus. Yeah. So, if a thousand people called me, I won't be able to mechanically uh, respond to a thousand phone calls. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but I am going to be doing that online thing uh, mm -hmm. and, and starting certainly in the next 60 days. Uh, yeah. and, and so uh, that's something I absolutely am going to do. And uh, it, But if you have a specific question, if you can save it for that, because I promise I'll answer any, if it's an answerable question. I mean, sometimes the answer has to be, I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, that is the only answer I have. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So uh, save the questions, and Russell's going to be doing seminars on Facebook Live, which yes, is awesome. Yes, absolutely. I'm excited for that. Um, and again, guys, if you like the show, please share this episode right now. And don't forget, we are doing the meetup tomorrow night at McFate Brewing by Scottsdale McDowell, where Mr. TTP Brent Daniels will be speaking. 5 o'clock, don't be late, or you'll be standing either standing in the room or standing outside the room. And next week, we do have Josiah Grimes with Keegley. Uh, so do come back for that. And thank you, Russell. It's a pleasure. It's really awesome a pleasure, show. Steve. A lot Thank of fun. you.